1968, Robin Knox Johnston set off to sail around the world in the Sunday Times Golden Globe race. This is his story. When a big wave's coming towards the boat, it's too late to be scared. That shark is stopping me, so he's got to go. This is appendicitis. I might be dying. I think uh, it's not a bad way to spend your life, actually. Robin Knox Johnston was an experienced merchant seaman. He'd spent eight years working for the British India Company on the shipping routes around India, East and South Africa. But in 1967, something happened that would change his life. As Gypsy Moth passed the breakwater, Sir Francis Chichester had completed his voyage round the world. That feat ensures him a proud place in the company of the greatest of maritime history. He stopped once in Australia, but it was an incredible voyage. And I think anyone vaguely interested realized that left one thing to be done, and that was to go non-stop. And uh, the idea sort of fixed on me, really. I thought, well, I'll try and get a sponsor. And I got some drawings made up of a much bigger boat, because a bigger boat goes faster. But I couldn't get any money, so uh, I eventually took the boat I got. And where did the name come from? Well. So Hale is a star, one of the navigation stars, and it's roughly sort of northwest. The wind in the Persian Gulf, where I've been working for four or five years, they named this particular wind the Suheli. And I thought, well, actually, that's the direction of England. My wife's name was Sue, so it seemed a sort of tactful thing to do. So what came first, your desire to sail non-stop or the... Sunday Times oh, challenge. My, I was writing a book about the voyage back from India, which I've never finished actually, um, and my agent said, I rang him up and said, I'm not going to finish that because I'm going to do something else. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to try and beat Chichester. He said, what are you going to do for money? I said, rob a bank, I'm going. And he put it to the Sunday Times. And they sent a journalist down to talk to me and he said, you know, you're going to beat Chichester. I said, I don't know, I hope so. Um, which was honest. But of course, that isn't what the journalist wanted. He wanted me to say, oh, I'll beat that also. And so, well, that isn't the way I work. So they decided that I didn't stand a chance, so don't bother with me. But then they realized there were other people thinking of doing it. So they announced on the 17th of March, 1968, that I was in a race they were organizing. I never actually entered it. I was in it. Eventually, the race was made up of nine competitors. They sailed down the Atlantic Ocean, past the Cape of Good Hope, towards Australia and New Zealand through the Roaring Forties, then around Cape Horn, up the South Atlantic and back across the North Atlantic. The voyage would take at least 10 to 12 months. The biggest threat in theory at the beginning was Alex Caruso, the Italian, because he had a 60-foot boat. So unfortunately, he got very ill and had to pull out into Lisbon very early on. After that, the most experienced sailor was Matessier, Bernard Matessier, the Frenchman. He had a bigger boat than me, um, so he, he knew all he was taking on. Therefore, he was the threat as far as I was concerned. But did they put any conditions or restrictions on you? Well, they tried to. Um, they said initially the race would start on the 31st of October, and I said, well, good luck. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going on the 1st of June. They said, well, you won't be able to be in our race. I said, well, you're catching on fast. What they couldn't grasp is Suhail is not a fast boat. You've got to look at Cape Horn and you want to pass that in midsummer in the Southern Hemisphere. To do that, I had to leave in June. If I left in October, I'd be going right around Cape Horn in the sort of coming into winter. And it's a dangerous place at the best of times and even worse in winter. And I wasn't alone. John Ridgway and Shade Blythe both said exactly the same thing. Did you ever have any doubts that it could be done? Neil, I was 28, 29. Um, you know, I'm a master mariner, I've been a captain by then, I'm pretty darned experienced. I've sailed my boat 20,000 miles, so I'm a good yachtsman, I know how to build the boats. I felt I had as good a chance as anyone else I'd heard of, of, do, of achieving it. And I just felt this is something I've really got to try and do. 
I don't want to be 90 looking into the shaving mirror and saying, I wish I'd done that. Can you give us an idea of what the provisions were? Well, it was mainly in tins because we didn't have freeze-dried food in those days. So, um, you know, I had a couple of hundred tins of bully beef, a couple of tins of stewed steak, baked beans, peas, beans, ca uh, carrots, potatoes. Take fresh food and hope it lasts. Two months would probably be maximum. Eggs, all greased in Vaseline, but they lasted about two months. And after that, you're on what you've got. But it's all in tins. Now, tins won't survive in a boat because they'll rust. And then eventually you hear this hissing noise and that's the contents. Um, well, the gas created by the contents escaping. So you have to treat them. Coat them white paint, took the labels off, and then varnish them to make them last longer. But even so, I mean, towards the end, I was getting a lot of tins. I mean, every night I'd hear a couple hissing. And when you, when you set off, I mean, how, how much of this area was, was filled with provisions that you needed? Well, from there to there was solid, with um, containers of water, uh, paraffin, uh, petrol for the generator, and such like, and uh, other spares and bits and pieces. Up the front were shelves. I took out the bunks and put shelves in, so all my food was up there, the fresh food was up there, potatoes, onions, that sort of thing. And then in these lockers here, and uh, they were full of tins. And there were more tins up front as well. And these bunks were still clear, but the outer bunks were full of stores. There wasn't a lot of room to move around. And was there a big send-off? Not really, no. People seem off of mother and father and my brother, Sunday Mirror, three of them, chap from the Sunday Times. And that was basically it. So, this is it. And uh, now there's all the background on the boat. Just so how much you know, you refer to anyone picks it up, they can see where the boat's registered and everything else. This is the this day, day one. This is the day I sailed. So you slipped at 13.45? Yep. Initially, um, taking it very easy because I, I got another attack of jaundice. And I knew if I went to hospital, they'd hospitalise me. I had to go then. So for the first month, I wasn't pushing very hard. Um, and then I started, you know, the signs disappeared and I felt better and I started to push. In 1971, Robin recreated parts of his voyage for a BBC television documentary. You know, you're pushing on, but at the same time you're thinking, getting close to the Southern Ocean, getting close to the Southern Ocean. What's it going to be like? I mean, the first 10 days in the Southern Ocean, I had six gales. It was that bad. And it was September, you see, I was early, um, deliberately. But I hadn't... Uh, anticipated that. That's when I lost my fresh water, smashed up the self-steering and the cabin top shifted and eventually led to me losing the radio and then got knocked over. How scared were you? When a big wave's coming towards the boat, it's too late to be scared. Now you've got to deal with it. Um, you know, on one occasion I saw one coming and I realised I couldn't get down inside the boat where I'd be safe. I was on deck, I'd get washed off, no question. I went up the rigging. Right, Neil, let me show you this one because this, this is of that instant where I climbed up the mast. In fact, the artist has put me halfway up the mast, uh, which is true, I mean, it's exactly what I did. And this wave broke right over the boat and it disappeared. So there's me and two masts and no land for 1,500 miles in any direction. Then, of course, the boat shook herself and up she popped. And the reason why she didn't broach is you can just see that blue line there. That's the warp I had out of stern, which was stopping her from swinging round in front of the wave. If she'd done that, I'd been dismasted. Basically, uh, it's tied onto the king post up the front. Well, led down one side all its way out and then back on board and tied back onto the king post. But that gives a tremendous amount of resistance. And so it holds the stern into the waves. But it stopped her losing control, swinging round in front 
And when that hits you and your sideways on, you've had it, you're going to be rolled, you lose the mass. You know, I'd hear the waves coming up, I'd hear them coming over the boat. I'd look through the portholes and see them suddenly go blue with the water. I knew she was quite safe like that. She wasn't getting thumped, she wasn't getting hammered. The boat was comfortable. That is what you spend all your time worrying about. Is my boat comfortable? And how were you bearing up? I was doing fine, actually. Um, you know, I had a few problems inevitably. I mean, battery acid in the eye hurts a bit. And it stopped me seeing for about a week um, in one eye. Repairing sails down the south, I mean, you had to bang your hands to bruise them so you could use a needle, because it's so cold. And I didn't have any gloves, and I couldn't have worked with the gloves anyway. I've been damp for five months now, all my clothing's been damp. And you say, well, yeah, but hang about. If this was easy, someone else would have done it. I've got this opportunity. So stop whinging, get on with it. Made excellent progress despite buffeting by waves, many of which were breaking right over the boat. Pounding heavily at times. This is the worst punishment Suheli has ever taken. So I'm in a gale at Force 8. I think what's incredible is how neat that writing is when you consider the conditions that you're writing in. Well, you wedge yourself, you see. The back of the boat in, inside, I've got my navigation area where the radio was, and I just wedged myself in quietly right. But you can see, Neil, I mean, I was sleeping then, because the log hasn't been filled in. Uh, but I'm up here, probably went to bed about midnight, did in fact, and I slept right the way through till probably after seven in the morning. So you have to sort of try and keep your mind active, and I took to learning poetry. I mean, at one time I could recite the whole of Gray's Elegy, which I learned, which was a wonderful poem, actually. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Keeping clean became part of Robin's routine on board Suhaley. So I dive off the bowsprit, swim like hell until the stern came along, come back on board, get out the seawater soap, cover myself in soap, and then dive off the bowsprit and fresh off, then climb back on board. But I had a rope out the stern in case I missed the stern of the boat. In your log, July the 13th, you talk about springing a leak in shark infested waters. It wasn't springing a leak, she was leaking. I mean, it was regular. It was about 200 gallons a day, which is a lot. I thought, well, I can't go in the Southern Ocean like this. I've got to stop it. And realised I had some copper that I could tack over the seam that was leaking. But it was about four and a half, five feet underwater. You go down, get a tack in, come up for air, go down, put another tack in, keep the hammer on a bit of string so it's down there anyway, ready for you. And you just work away at it. And I was working away, probably you know, three or four hours, um, maybe longer. And then I was aware of this grey shape swimming around me. Now it, was, it wasn't excited, it was just curious, so that's all right. Um, so it went on for a bit longer, then it started to get a bit more jerky, and I thought, time to get out. Uh, so I climbed out of the water, and of course it wouldn't go away. Well, I've got this half-attached piece of copper. I can't afford to lose it. That shark is stopping me, so he's got to go. So I threw some lavatory paper in the water and the scavengers, he came up thinking it was white meat. When his head broke the surface, I shot him. And I waited half an hour just to make sure blood and stuff hadn't attracted mates to come and eat him and perhaps me at the same time. And I went back and finished the job. But it was no choice. I mean, he had to go. He was, he was threatening me.
first human contact I had for 147 days, actually, apart from on the radio until it broke, was the pilot vessel off Melbourne. And I sailed up to him. And it was quite a reasonably calm day. And so this little boat comes up with its signal flags up, British flag, and says, and he looked down and said, yeah. I said, um, hello, mate, uh, will you take my mail? He said, no, clear off. You know. I said, look, I'm 147 days out from the UK. Um, I wonder if you could report me and, and take some mail and stuff. Well, they did, they did actually report me um, because a plane came over a couple of days later and I'd actually got a, a sunny, calm day. I was in the best straight. And I got everything out to air and I was lying out there stark naked, just enjoying the sun, you know, after being, well, white from being covered in damp clothing. And I got the generator running and everything's fine in the world. I'm just cruising along, I know where I am. And I suddenly became aware of another noise. And I looked up and there was this light aircraft with a photographer leaning out, taking pictures. I put a towel on bloody quickly. There's no point in advertising. So. And you really miss her. What do you want to do when the voyage is over? Hot bath. Anything else? Steak, egg and chips with, uh, well, new boiled potatoes, fresh peas, a beautiful juicy sirloin steak, medium rare, uh, two eggs, and uh, lemon meringue pie. Oh, and the first thing, a pint of English beer. Trust, I miss English beer. And he said, oh, I've got some mail. I said, oh, shove it over. He said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? Just pass it to me. He said, no, no. Sunday times have changed the rules. If I give you this mail, it's outside assistance. I said, oh, you're joking. So he sat on this boat five yards away, opening my letters and reading them to me. <laughs> As he passed the horn, the sea was almost miraculously calm, and he had every reason to celebrate. January the 17th. We've passed it, spiced the main brace and brought out Aunt Aileen's cake. To add to my pleasure, there is a piece of the Times in the tin, so I have something new to read. I carefully removed the foil wrapping and the aroma hit me. I cut a reasonable slice. I'll make it last a bit if I can. I had no idea where the other competitors were after New Zealand. I heard of people I'd not heard of before, like Tetley and Crowhurst. They were just names to me. I knew that Ridgeway was out, Che Blythe was out, King was out, Fougeron was out, Caruzzo was out. I knew that. And Matesio was behind me and was slowing. He'd been very quick down the Atlantic, but he was much slower in the Southern Ocean. Well, Tetley's boat sank. Matesio decided not to finish, changed course and headed to the Pacific Islands and Crowhurst's boat was found abandoned. It later became known that he realised his boat couldn't have withstood the Southern Oceans and had faked his voyage. With the realisation that his deception would have been discovered, he appears to have committed suicide. This only left Robin Knox Johnston in the race. You were missing for 137 days. D did you know you were missing? Well, I wasn't missing because I knew where I was. But of course, to the rest of the world, I was missing. Every time I saw a ship, I'd try and call him up. Um, I called up one off the equator uh, when I had appendicitis. And you know, I thought, boy, this may be the last humans I'll see. And I called him up with a lamp, no answer, lit a flare, no answer, fired a distress, ro a distress rocket. He just sailed straight past. So how did you treat that? Well, I didn't have the drugs you need to keep it under control. So I, I went on a sort of sloppy diet didn't eat very much at all. I went on very soft food like porridge and things like that. Uh, I didn't eat meat or vegetables or anything like that. And I was doubled up in the cockpit for three days. I mean, I was in a lot of pain. Um, and then it began to fade. And I eventually thought I'd poison myself with my cooking. At, at what point did you manage to make contact then with, with, with the UK and effectively plan your homecoming? And it was Easter Saturday, actually. Uh, I think it was the 5th of April. About 7 o'clock, I called up a ship called the Mobile Acme, British. And the chap on watch signaled back. And, of course, we'd probably been to the same nautical college for our exams. And I suddenly realised he's reading me. 
he, the way he's acknowledging, he's getting what I'm saying. So I said, um, you know, what ship? Where will that be? Um, I sent back, a yacht Suhedi reported missing. M-I-K, which is the code for please report me to Lloyd's. He went, R, repeat name. I thought, yes, yes, he's reading me. I then had to rely on him, you know, was he going to bother with this little yacht bobbing around in the ocean on Easter Saturday night, you know, what the hell's going on? Well, 20 to 9, my brother picked up the phone from Lloyd's to say I've been sighted. And actually the mirror stopped the presses and changed the front page. And there was an awful lot going on ashore which I knew nothing about. Robin Knox Johnston's parents are waiting at St Mary's on the Isles of Scilly for the first sight of the sun they haven't seen for over 300 days. The Knox Johnstons are guests of one newspaper group which has chartered the biggest ship on the Isles, the Queen of the Isles. Also waiting in the harbour, a high-speed launch chartered by the paper that sponsored Robin's voyage. But at the moment, there's little cooperation between the different factions who are trying to be the first to intercept the 30-year-old Merchant Navy officer. I got a code with the mirror, um, which I, I, the radio worked long enough <laughs> to get it across, and then, of course, the fuse went again. Well, towards the end, after the search hadn't found him, we really were beginning to get worried, because while somebody's out in mid-ocean, you can sort of think of them in mid-ocean, you don't worry, but when the people have started looking for them and don't find them, then you do begin to wonder. And I think that last week we were worried. And then they said, what time are you going to finish? I said, nine o'clock. And they said, um, ah, it's my slowing up. I said, why? Well, the mayor and mayoress are going to meet you, but the mayoress has got a hair appointment at nine o'clock. I said, can't you have it done earlier? No. OK, so I slowed up. The wind changed. I didn't finish till 3.20 in the afternoon, which time the poor dear's hairstyle was ruined by the wind anyway. So. And the cannon has gone. The cannon has gone. Day 312, about 25 past 3 on April the 22nd. And Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. And of course I got into the harbour and the first people to board me are the customs. They don't trust anyone, do they? And they jumped on board, two immaculate customs officers. They said, Good afternoon, Captain, where from? Back the of the they knew perfectly well where I was from. <laughs> it was just the age-old question. They were doing it right. And I said, Falmouth. And that was it. That was the finish. So as, as well as the your achievements, there were two prizes. There was the trophy and a cash prize. Uh, wh where's the trophy? Trophies at my old school. I want to encourage people to think outside the box, dream beyond. So that's where it is. It's in the middle of Hertfordshire. Robin was also awarded the £5,000 for being the fastest, but decided to give the money to the widow and family of Donald Crowhurst, who were now facing financial ruin. Well, I never expected to win it, uh, so it wasn't something I budgeted to have. But also I felt huge sympathy for the Crowhurst. Um, four children, oldest 12, going to lose their house, lost their husband, lost their dad. I don't think my conscience would have allowed that, uh, so it seemed the right thing to do. Well, since winning the Golden Globe race, Robin has circumnavigated the globe three more times, including another solo non-stop in 2007. He was awarded a CBE in 1969 and knighted in 1995. And in 1996, he founded the Clipper Race, where members of the public can take part, either for the whole circumnavigation or a particular leg. You give ordinary people now an opportunity to follow into your footsteps. Mm. How important is that legacy for you? Every time you see someone you've helped sail around the world or achieve their sailing dream and they come up and say, you gave me the idea, I think oh, that was worth it. They've achieved something special with their lives. They've crossed an ocean. Over 5,000 of them now. You know, of course I'm proud of that proud of all those people, taken out of their normal humdrum lives and shown that they can do more than they thought. I think uh, that's not a bad way to spend your life, actually. I look back at it and say, well, 
The 29-year-old me made the right decision to go. The 29-year-old me was probably almost the best prepared for that voyage. And the 29-year-old me was stubborn enough to just push on. Faced with that opportunity today, will I go for it? And the chances are if I could find it, I probably would still.